Hi everybody, this is the First Peter study and this is the 18th uh, segment of the study. We're going to be in First Peter chapter 3 verses uh, 18 through 22. We're actually starting that section of scripture but really spending most of our time in just half of verse 18 today. There's just so much there to unpack and uh, we're only going to have time for that today. Um, this is one of the most challenging sections of Scripture, I think, that, that actually uh, you can find in the Bible. In fact, John MacArthur uh, makes, makes this point where he says, This passage, frankly, demands the best from the interpreter, it demands the best from the preacher, and it demands the best from the people who are listening if we are to grasp the truth of this passage. So this is going to take a little bit of work as we work our way through this passage. And again, today we're just going to introduce it. We're going to start with verse 18 and really just hang right there in verse 18. So let me pray and then we're going to read it and then we'll start to unpack it. Father, thank you for your word and we do pray for your help. We pray for guidance, for direction, for your spirit who inspired these words to illuminate these words that we might understand the truth uh, that you have for us today. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me go ahead and read the passage for you. It's 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through 22. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Now, now, Peter is still um, carrying on with his main theme in this letter, which is trying to encourage believers who are suffering for the cause of Christ. And here, he wants us to consider the example of Christ so that not only will we engage suffering for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel, but so that we will actually triumph in our suffering, that we will be victorious in our suffering, in, in the sense that we will not give up, we will persevere, we will endure till the end, and we will do it with the same kind of attitude that Jesus had when he went to the cross. He went to the cross for the joy set before him, despising the shame. And so God wants us, if we are called to suffer, and all of us have been called to suffer something for the cause of Christ. Again, the promise is if you desire to live God in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. You may not die for your faith. You may not be experiencing physical persecution. But there's going to be some kind of pressure upon us when we are trying to live godly in Christ Jesus. And he, God wants us to go through that experience triumphantly and victoriously. So he gives us this passage. Again, we're going to deal with just the first part of verse 18, which says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Now there's five truths in this passage that I want to raise for us. And number one is that Christ's suffering was ultimate. Notice that it says, for Christ also died. Listen, you can't suffer any more than that. That's leaving it all on the field, or in Christ's case, leaving it all on the cross. He didn't just faint. He didn't swoon. He died on the cross for our sins. He suffered to the point of death. Now, some versions, like the NIV, uh, don't use the word die. They say, for Christ also suffered for sins. The New American Standard, which I'm using, says, for Christ also died for sins. I think that's the better translation, died. But again, uh, some early, early versions have the word suffered in there, and, and it's because the copyists put that in there. Uh, it was synonymous. They understood that Christ's suffering led to his death. So they're talking about the same thing, but I think died is probably a better rendering. So Christ's suffering was ultimate. And in using this word also, Peter is insinuating that, that, that we as followers of Jesus may also be called upon to die for the sake of Christ. Now, we're not going to die for sins, 
but it could be that as a believer, there are uh, there may be an, uh, the possibility that you could actually end up dying for the cause of Christ. I mean, people do die for the cause of the gospel in many places of the world. And so he's saying not only just did Christ die as a result of suffering, but his followers could also die as the result of suffering for Christ. Now again, it's not talking about us dying for sin. Only Christ died for sin. We may die for the sake of the gospel so that someone may come to Christ and be saved, but we will never die for someone else's sins. Only Christ could do that and did that. So Christ's suffering was ultimate. Number two, Christ died for sins which were not his own. It says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. He died for the sins of the unjust, the unrighteous. That is people like us who are sinners. Um, 1 Peter 2, 22 tells us that Jesus committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. In fact, if we, if we read the whole passage, verse 21 on, for you've been called for this purpose. There it is, called for this purpose of suffering, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Okay? So he died for sins which were not his own. He lived his entire life without committing sin. He never had an evil thought. He never had an evil word. He never had an evil reaction, an evil response. He, he never thought anything that wasn't perfectly holy. He never said anything that wasn't perfectly holy. He and, and, and yet he's the one who goes to the cross, and he is the one who dies for the sins of sinners. It was our sins that put him on the cross. So Christ's suffering was ultimate. He died for sins that were not his own. And the third thing we see in this passage is he died once for sins. It says again, for Christ also died for sins once for all. He did not have to die repetitively in order to pay for our sins. His once for all death for our sins was completely sufficient to pay for all of the sins of those people who will believe in him. His death was complete. It was comprehensive. It was sufficient. Now, Hebrews 7.26 says, For it's fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So Jesus offered up himself, as the ultimate offering for sins once, and he put away the sins of all who would believe in him. So his suffering was ultimate. It was for sins, and it was done once and for all. Another passage that you could look at uh, in your spare time would be Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28, which spells this out very powerfully. Um, and, and then John 6, 37, I think, adds to this as well. When Jesus says, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me, the ones who come to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone, everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of sins for everyone who would come to him, behold him, look upon him, and desire him believe in him, embrace him as Lord and Savior, and trust in him for the forgiveness of sin and for eternal life. And anyone who does that 
Everyone who does that is going to be saved. No one will be cast out from God who comes to Jesus for salvation. Okay? So his, his sacrifice was ultimate. His death was the ultimate price. He, he, he came and he paid the price for sins which were not his own because he had no sin. And he died once for all. There is no other penalty payment for our sin penalty. There is no other way that we can be saved other than through Christ who paid it all. Now the fourth thing that we see here is that Christ's suffering and death were vicarious or substitutionary. In other words, he died for people or in the place of people, okay? He died as the substitute of those people who would come to him for salvation, the righteous for the unrighteous, uh, for the unrighteous. Peter writes, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. So Jesus, the sinless one, died for the sinful. Jesus, the righteous one, died for the unrighteous. Jesus, the just, died for the unjust. Jesus, who had no sin and thus no guilt and no shame, died in the place of those who were guilty of sin and who had shame. And Jesus goes to the cross and he takes our sin, he takes our blame, and he takes our shame. You know, St. Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin. God the Father made him who knew no sin, who was Jesus, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. So God took the judgment that belonged to us as the perfect, full, and final sacrifice for sins. Um, that was the fourth thing. So Christ's suffering and death was vicarious or substitutionary. And the fifth thing I want to raise out of this passage is that Christ's suffering brings believers to God. This is the whole really ultimate purpose for him going to the cross, was, which was to bring us to God. The gospel brings us to God. It reconciles us to God the Father. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. So the purpose uh, of Christ's death toward us who believe in Jesus was to reconcile us to God, uh, which is what it means to bring us to God. The word us is referring to everyone who places faith in Christ alone for salvation from sin and from its eternal penalty, which is separation from God forever. Listen, God is not bringing unbelievers to God. He's not saving unbelievers. He has saved those who will place faith in him, and he brings those people to God. He reconciles them to God. Now, the verb phrase to bring us to God is a powerful phrase. It's, it's actually a, a purpose clause in Greek, and, and that's what Peter is writing this in, is Koine Greek, this letter. It was often used to denote uh, the idea of, of introducing someone to a king. But before you introduced him to the king, you provided access for that person to the king. And, and then you brought them into the presence of the king. You introduced them, and then you brought them even into a relationship with that king. Uh, that's what this word bring means. It's the Greek word prosago. Uh, back in Bible days, if you wanted to see a king in his palace, you would have to go through a prosago. You would have to go through a designated person who would provide you with access to the king. So he would open the door so that you could go into the throne room. He would provide you with that access. But not only would he provide you with that access, he would then go with you and introduce you to the king so that now you have a relationship with this king. Well, that's what Jesus does for us at the cross of Calvary. He opens the door for us to go into a relationship with God the Father, and he introduces us to God the Father as his own. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but 
by me. Acts 4.12 puts it this way. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. No other name. It's Jesus or nothing. If you want eternal life, if you want access to God the Father, if you want a relationship with God the Father, if you want to be introduced to God the Father, you must come to Him through Jesus Christ. And maybe you're asking, well, well, how do I come to Christ to have him introduce me to God? Well, you have to come with a, a sense of your sin. You need to realize that you're a sinner who needs to be forgiven by God. And you realize that Jesus came to earth as the God-man, died on the cross to pay for your sins, rose again the third day to prove that the payment he offered God on your behalf was acceptable and you embraced Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You embraced the work that he accomplished at the cross of Calvary on your behalf and that's what gives you access to God the Father. It is through Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection that gives you and I access to God, an introduction to God and a relationship with God and that is really the gospel message. So Peter is saying to us that when we suffer, we should suffer the same way that Jesus suffered triumphantly with a purpose in mind. Now our purpose is not that we ourselves bring people to God, but it can be that through our suffering for the gospel, that God, the Son, Jesus Christ, is able to use our suffering to bring someone to himself that he may then reconcile to God the Father. So Peter wants us to understand that our suffering is for a purpose. If God indeed is bringing suffering into our lives for the sake of the gospel, it is for the purpose of honoring him, glorifying him, exalting Christ, and using our suffering for the gospel to bring someone else into access with God the Father. So that's verse 18. That's all the time we have for today. So trust that this will be a blessing to you. And uh, we will continue to work through this passage and flesh it out. And uh, next week we'll be in the second part of verse 18 and work our way down as far as we can. Know you prayed for and know that, that uh, um, you're loved. And we'll look forward to uh, seeing you next time as we look through First Peter.